stuff. How you all doing? Excellent. So welcome to day two here on the Alpha Stage. We have another day of amazing speakers, awesome content, code technology to share with you. A couple of things just to remind you about, first of all. Uh, so we are running, uh, I notice a lot of you folks out there have been tweeting with the hashtag buildstuffconf. Um, apparently, there is a competition. The person with the most build stuff conf tweets will be entered into a draw to win an iPhone. So get out there, get on Twitter. Let's get the rest of the world afraid of missing out because they are not here with us in person being part of Build Stuff 2022. Don't forget, on the back of your badges, you have the sponsor bingo. Go around, visit all of our partners. We couldn't do this event without them. We really appreciate their support. They'd love to talk to you and get stamps from all of them and hand in your bingo card. Build stuff by 4 p.m. tomorrow. You will be entered into a prize for tonight. The Build Stuff Party. We are going to be uh, heading uh, downtown to uh, the venue whose name I forgot to check the pronunciation. Uh, it's in your programs. It's on the website. Check on down there. We've got a couple of awesome acts. We've got uh, Francesco, who did the opening yesterday, is going to be doing a longer live coding set. Uh, we've got a band, a rock band of local Lithuanian developers who put together a show just for us. And then I will be on stage with some of the other speakers here doing a line breaker set towards the end of the evening there. So come on down to that. Join us. Have some drinks. Have some fun chat to the rest of the crew. It's going to be awesome. All right. Now, please welcome our keynote speaker opening up on day two, talking about iconoclasm. He's somebody who has uh, written books on F sharp, books on C sharp, books on Java. He's written courses for Pluralsight. He's written uh, a lot of code over the years. Please give it up. Massive round of applause. Ted Neward. That intro, I kind of feel overwhelmed. Like, oh gosh, I better really have, you know, made, done a done a good presentation. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'll have to take up my fallback career of being a rock star. <sighs> nothing, nothing. You want me to sing for you? No, you don't. You really don't. See, they don't. They know. They don't. <laughs> Join us tonight, Line Breakers, featuring guest vocalist Ted Neward. <laughs> and let you do your talk Happy now, Ted. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> you really don't. You really don't. Hey, question for you. You recognize them? No? Nope. No, nope, because that is the mythical team of outsourcers that is out for your job. See, when I was a kid growing up, doing, you know, uh, primary school, middle school, etc. The formula for success in life was pretty simple. Go to school, get good grades, study hard, go to college, right? Go uh, pick a major, pick a field, get good grades, because the grades were always a key part of this. Graduate, and you could expect to pick up a position pretty much a given if you had any sort of college degree, even a art history degree. You could pick up a degree, make 70,000 a year, which back then, because you know, you see all this gray in my beard, right? I'm old. 70 grand a year was a pretty respectable salary. You could get the house, you could get the spouse, you could get the two and a half kids, the dog. It was all just sort of laid out in front of you. It was awesome. I mean, we had a whole slew of different tests that really reinforce this, right? We had the SAT test. Now I realize this is all, you know, US centric, but I imagine there's something relatively similar here in Europe. The scholastic aptitude test is one of these tests that tests how well you will do in college. It's one of the college admissions prerequisites. It's one of the things that high school students in the United States consistently are afraid of, consistently concerned about. And as a result, there is a preparatory SAT test, the PSAT test. If you want to go into law school, there's the GMAT test. And as a matter of fact, we are so fond of tests that we've even created a test just for the joy of having a test called the Wonderlick. The Wonderlick is a test that's intended to sort of, you know, not necessarily an IQ test, but to try to test general intelligence. It's rumored that many NFL executives 
will have draft picks go through the Wonderlick test because apparently you have to be really, really smart to play American football. I don't know if that's true or not. We even have tests that will tell you what field you should go into. Sorry, this mic is constantly flipping up on my ear. I'll be doing this for a while, I think. We have tests that will tell you what field to go into. I actually took one of those tests in junior high school, and it told me that I should actually become a priest. Oh, I see. You laugh at that joke, but all the rest of them, you're like, no, we're, we're too good to laugh. We had so many tests. We had so many things that were designed to help you down this path. But the formula seems to be changing. See, it doesn't seem to be a guarantee anymore that if you follow this path, riches and success will follow you. Particularly for us in the States, there is this, there's been this, and it continues to grow, this idea that there are all these people in all these other countries, particularly in the non-Western countries, that are coming for our jobs. There have been numerous reports about the number of engineering graduates that India churns out every year. China churns out more engineering graduates than the entire United States combined. <clears throat> and it turns out that many of these places, well, Russia is a bit of a weird cat right now anyway. Nobody really wants to hire people from Russia, uh, at least if they want to show their face anywhere in the West. But a lot of these places, they're a lot cheaper to live in. And many of the executives will look at the fact that we can hire a team of developers for like $150,000 each versus a team of developers for like $15,000 each and they will clearly opt for the second option because it allows them to fail more cheaply. Okay, that doesn't generate any reaction. <laughs> fail more cheaply. Come on, maybe, maybe my English is not great. No. Well, no, your English is lovely. It's better than my Lithuanian, let me tell you that. <laughs> Everybody is worried about outsourcing. And it's the wrong thing to worry about. Do you know who this is? Chessboard's a dead giveaway. Gary Kasparov, one of the finest chess players possibly ever. Gary Kasparov has just an unparalleled record of success in playing matches, playing chess. He won his first world championship in 1985, very, very young age unparalleled run of success ever since, all the way up until he played against a computer. Back in 1997, some of you may actually be old enough to remember this, 97, Kasparov took on IBM's best chess algorithm ever. They called it Deep Blue. And frankly, Kasparov was so rattled in the first match that he completely like, messed up the rest of the match. He could not believe a computer could play chess this well. He ended up losing the match the first time that a grandmaster had actually lost in tournament play to a completely automated piece of software. It gets better, by the way. Remember a few years later, IBM became very, very popular for putting their Watson software up on the game show uh, Jeopardy, going up against Ken Jennings, who was the at that time the undisputed Jeopardy champion of the world, and Watson kicked Jennings' ass. At the end of the week of shows, Jennings uttered the now famous quote, I welcome our future robotic overlords. Automation. And it's really funny to be having this conversation because we typically are on the other side of this. We are typically the ones saying, yeah, we build the automation. And yet, all you other fields that are worried about the fact that we as software developers can automate things, you shouldn't be worried. It's not that big a deal. Rising tide, all boats, all that kinds of stuff. But then tools like GitHub Copilot came out. And suddenly, computers could start writing software. And suddenly, developers started getting a little nervous, the same way that doctors and lawyers and other places have been nervous for quite some time. 
There is a site in the United States, I don't know if it's actually usable here in, in Europe, but it's LegalZoom.com, where you can file many of your legal documents. Your family lawyer is now a website. And so now if you want to create a new business, if you want to create a trust, if you want to file for divorce, probably want to let your spouse know before you do that, but you know, LegalZoom will let you do any of these sorts of things. You no longer need the family lawyer. We used to have a family doctor. Now we have WebMD. Has anybody, by the way, ever gone up to WebMD and come away convinced they were going to die within a week? Yeah, there's reasons why you probably don't want to do that. But automation allows the unskilled to do the things that historically used to be the province of just the skilled. And this has tremendous implications for scale. So has tremendous implications for performance. Used to be that if you broke a bone, they would take an x-ray. Somebody who was familiar with the skeletal structure would take a look at the x-ray and determine whether or not you have actually a broken bone or if it's just a sprain or what have you. A number of years ago at a medical conference, a company put a device up on the stage, looked like kind of a giant you know, copier type thing, and they say, we have now automated the process of examining x-rays. They took an x-ray, they put it, they pushed the button. A few minutes later, a result came back, the bone is broken, and everybody in the audience went, oh my gosh, this is amazing, medical advancements everywhere. We found out later that actually it was faxing it to a team of doctors in India. <laughs> but why should we care? That is merely an implementation detail, right? Exactly. Whether they're using a back-end stack or a different back-end stack, it's all the same. Developers are now starting to feel the pinch that other fields have felt for quite some time. This notion that our jobs could be automated makes us scared, makes us worried, gives us a certain amount of existential dread like, crap, what do I do now in this near future when artificial intelligence will do everything? Right? On the one hand, maybe we just sign up for the lounge chairs from Wally -E and we just you know, drift around and eat and get fat and hey, that's life, right? That doesn't sound too terribly bad. But most of us realize that's probably not going to be the case. So what do we do? How do we stop this? The short answer is we don't. We can't. There's really never been any case in human history where technology has been effectively walked back with the one exception of the Japanese and gunpowder. And even so, they continued to use it for fireworks and so forth. That was a social decision. Meanwhile, the technology continued to flourish. You can't really stop the march of the robots. So, now that you're all good and profoundly depressed, what do we do? We evolve. We do something different. We do the things that machines are not good at. You know who this is? Up by name. It's, what's that? Pixel. Pixel, no. This, however, you probably got somebody like this inside your company. This is that, that character, that developer, that analyst, that now possibly VP, who was staring out the window one day and had an idea that then turned into a hugely successful program, product, company, whatever. And the thing of it is, we all of us look at people like this and we say, wow, how do they do it? The funny thing is, it's not that hard to do. You just have to know what to do like many things. The first time you ever looked at any sort of program code, you said, oh my gosh, it's all complete gibberish. And then as you learned to program, it all began to make more sense. And today, you watch television programs and somebody's hacking and you look on the screen and it's like HTML. You're like, that's, ha no, that's, that's terrible. And you're that person in the movie theater who jumps up and shouts, that's not hacking. And your spouse is like, Shh, sit down, sit down. Or maybe that's just me, I don't know. Anybody can be that individual. 
Anybody can be the one that has the idea that generates the million dollar benefit. Anyone can suggest the solution to the problem that will completely make everything better. Anyone can be that person. Anyone can be the kind of person that does things that others say cannot be done, a.k.a. an iconoclast. The term actually officially refers to the idea of the destroyer of icons. The iconoclast is somebody who's destroying icons, and it stems from history way back in the day back in the time of the Roman Empire, right, specifically the Eastern Roman Empire, out there where today modern Turkey is, Leo III was getting ready to take control of the throne. And like many of his predecessors, he realized that he was going to have a little bit of a contentious relationship with the church. Because for those of you who remember your history, if you look at any of the paintings, the the king, the emperor, whatever the secular ruler, is always crowned by a religious figure. This is literally the church reminding the secular figures that we are the ones who gave you your crown with the implicit threat that we can be the ones to take it away too. We excommunicate you, everybody will hate you, you will lose your kingdom, the end. If you looked at the throne that Leo III sat on, it's decorated with a number of religious icons. Again, the implication being the church is above the king or the emperor in this particular case. And so Leo III said, you know what? I don't agree. I don't agree. I think if I'm the king, I get to do whatever the hell I want, no matter what the church says. And so he literally got up on his throne and tore down the religious symbology that decorated his throne. He became the destroyer of the religious icons and crowned himself emperor. That was ballsy. That was really, really brave. And, uh, you know, the church did their usual thing, and Leo said, okay. And he had a few problems in his reign, but for the most part, you know, he didn't miss the church much. He did the thing that others of his contemporaries said could not be done. Since that time, we've had a number of iconoclasts that have graced our presence throughout history, who have looked at things differently, decided they didn't like the status quo, sought to change it, and in most respects made the world better. There have been a few iconoclasts who have done so and made the world worse, but we don't care about those people, so let's not study them. List of folks, some of whom we'll be talking about today, Florence Nightingale, Walt Disney, Ray Kroc, do you know who that is? McDonald's, yeah. Ever wondered why it's not called Crocs? Well, aside from the fact that the shoes hadn't been invented yet, but because he actually didn't create the business. He bought it from the McDonald's brothers and then added the special touches that made McDonald's the worldwide powerhouse that it is. The drive-through, the fast food concept, the whole nine yards. He's the one that made McDonald's into McDonald's, but he didn't actually start the business. There are many cases of this where people just take something and add on in various ways to make it more interesting. We've had a few iconoclasts in our industry as well. Alan Kay, small talk, objects, the graphical user interface, the mouse, the laptop. The Dynabook was actually a K invention at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Park, and would essentially set the mold for laptops and mice that would, you know, become to be part of the, I mean, it's hard to imagine what the industry would look like without laptops or mice. Those were both his inventions. He invented what we now think of as object-oriented programming. You know what Kay's most famous quote with respect to that is? I invented the term object-oriented programming, and I can tell you for sure C++ was not what I had in mind. Linus Torvalds, Linux, and Git pretty much goes without saying. Dave Thomas, Ruby Dave? Ruby Dave actually brought Ruby into the mainstream. Ruby had been around for many, many years, but it's really not until Dave starts talking about Ruby and Rails, 
on, on, on many conferences in the United States that people started paying attention to it. He then later on said, you know what? I like writing books, but the current mechanisms for doing so with publishers is just awful. If you've ever had to write a book then, you had to use a very specific Microsoft Word template and the, the code had to be formatted in a very, very specific way. Dave said, I'm a developer. Why can't I just write it in a source that's comfortable for me and then transform it into something that's camera ready for the, the, the people who are going to print it? And thus was the Pragmatic Publishers Press born, which has now seen I don't know how many hundreds, thousands of titles come through its uh, hallways, particularly because it's very easy for people who are developers to write books for Pragprog, the, the, the publishing company. Where Dijkstra, Robin Milner, who invented essentially the ability to do uh, type inference. Hadley Milner type inference is a common scheme for a lot of functional languages. Functional languages in turn influences language like C Sharp and Java. These are people who did things that in many cases others said, nah, there's no way. There's no way a compiler could ever be smart enough to know what kind of variable you're looking to use without you having to explicitly say this is a string. If you become an iconoclast, you're almost impossible to fire because you see the world differently. You approach things differently. You have the necessary tools to be able to convince others of what you see. And as a result, there is a tremendous amount of value that gets associated to you that others simply cannot match. So the next question is, how do I do this? Well, for that, I'd invite you to sign up for my website seminar. No, I'm teasing. I know, I thought about walking off stage with that, but that just seemed rude. The iconoclast does three things. They perceive the world differently, they overcome the fear of being out there on the stage by themselves, and they have social intelligence that allows them to communicate their message effectively. Let's start with the first one, perceiving the world differently. Everybody look up for a second. See those light bulbs above you? They actually require more power than your brain does. You are literally the dimmest bulb in this room right now. Your brain operates on about 40 watts of power. Those are probably several hundred watts churning out to get all that light to make it so very warm on this stage. That is not a lot of power. Your laptop consumes more power than that. And in order to be able to maximize its processing efficiency, your brain takes a great deal of shortcuts along the way. When I show you this picture, what do you see? What's that? Backman? Back Backman? Oh, Pac-Man. You see three Pac-Man. Okay. How many people saw three Pac-Man? couple of hands. How many people saw three black circles with a white triangle and a gray triangle? A lot more hands. Sorry, Pac-Man, you lose. That's not actually what I drew there. What I drew is actually three Pac-Men and then three white curly or, or angle brackets. That's actually what I drew. But your brain said, hey, you know what? I've seen this before. I've seen like when things fall down on the table and one of them is on top of the other, what the gamers will refer to as Z-order or the user interface specialists, right? I know that there's a gray triangle sitting on top of the white triangle sitting on top of those three black circles. I know that because I've seen it before. Your brain taking shortcuts is engaging in a form of pattern recognition. Essentially saying, I've seen this pattern, I know how this story ends, let's just jump straight to the conclusion. Which means that what we perceive, what we think we see, is a matter of the brain, not the eyes. Case in point, you've seen this optical illusion hundreds of times before. The two horizontal lines, they are in fact the same length, correct? Is there anyone who disagrees with that statement? No, because a couple of you in the back are doing this. Yeah, they're the same length. 
But why does your brain continue to insist that in fact the top horizontal line looks longer than the bottom one? Because you are an experienced brain. You've been out there. You've been outside. You've walked along railroad tracks and you've seen that as the parallel rails go off into the distance, you've seen the horizontal wooden ties appear to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And you, your brain says, aha, perspective. I know what this is. I know how this works. So therefore, if the edges of the horizontal line appear closer to those two vertical lines, they must be, it must be because the horizontal line up there at the top is longer. Because your brain is trained that way. Now, the fascinating thing is, you look at this optical illusion, and now I show you this picture. Is there any more optical illusion? You, you think the two horizontal lines are potentially not the same length? No, you just like, you just like trying to heckle, don't you? Yeah, yeah you're, just, you're, just, you're just trying. It's okay. It's all right. I was you once. You'll get better. Medication helps. It doesn't. Oh, God. You, you folks may want to scoot a couple of chairs away from, from that guy. This does not trigger the optical illusion. Why? Because this is not familiar. This does not look like what we see when we stand on the railroad tracks or when we stand at the base of the tall skyscraper or when we sit in the middle of the uh, highway. Right? Not recommended, by the way. The most likely way that we will perceive something is a matter consistent with your past experience. Dwell on that for just a second. The most likely way that you will perceive something has everything to do with what you've experienced in the past and has nothing to do with what's right in front of you. Remember, perception is a matter of the brain, not the eyes. So because you have experience with perspective, you fall into that optical illusion, even though intellectually you know that that's not the case. Which then raises the question, what happens when you see this? How many of you see your architecture? How many of you seen the architecture that you worked on 10 years ago? How many of you see the architecture you worked on 20 years ago? Because this is the universal architecture diagram. Codenamed box arrow, box arrow, cylinder, patent pending. See, the funny thing is when you see this, you implicitly believe that you know what's going on here. This is a browser talking to a web server talking to the database. No, 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 no. This is a mobile device using API calls to talk to the database. No, 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 no. This is actually an application talking to middleware that's talking to the database. No, 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 no. These are applications talking over other APIs to applications. No, this is a terminal talking to a mainframe talking to a flat file. I'm not kidding. This is the universal architectural diagram. The next time you want to interview for an architect role, walk up to the whiteboard, draw a box, arrow, box, arrow, cylinder, sit down, and wait for the offer letter. <laughs> Do you know who this is? This is Dale Chihuly. You know who that is? Not unless you're really into things like decorative glasswork. Chihuly is probably the most successful American artist ever. Chihuly actually has made bazillions of dollars. He's actually had a solo art show at the Louvre. And, I mean, you guys here in Lithuania know, the French hate the Americans. I mean, they just, I mean, if they could somehow go through life without ever admitting that America actually exists... They would do so in a heartbeat. So for the French to have an American do an exhibit in the Louvre, a solo exhibit in the Louvre, he has to be somewhat special. Chihuly's glass pieces go for millions at a pop for the big ones. If you've ever walked into a fancy hotel, looked up and seen this huge glass display hanging from the ceiling, 
That's a Chihuly or it's one of his disciples. It's astounding how much money the man turns out. And it's all because he lost an eye. Right? A number of years ago, as he was a young glass worker, he went out, the story, the story is that he went out surfing. And the surfboard hit him above the eye line and damaged his eye so his vision was effectively permanently impaired. And shortly thereafter, he was doing something else and actually injured his shoulder. So now he's got one good eye and one good arm. And I don't know if you've ever tried to do any glass blowing, but it requires you use like a 10 foot long metal staff that's got a hole running all the way through it. You stick the staff into the molten glass, you swirl a little bit, what they call a gather, then you blow a bubble in it and that's what gives you the ability to start twirling it and doing some various things with it. Wow, this thing really just does not want to stay. At the time, the decorative glass industry was all about doing things that looked completely symmetrical, perfectly symmetrical. And Chihuly having lost an eye means he's lost his stereoscopic vision. And so now he can't really do anything symmetrical and he can't really do this one armed. So while he's just kind of sitting back waiting to recover, he says, you know what? This whole symmetrical thing, screw it. I'm not gonna go for symmetry. I'm gonna do stuff like this that is not in any way, shape, or form attempting to be symmetrical. And the world loved it. They thought it was awesome. He manages a studio of roughly over 100 people in Seattle churning out pieces worldwide. And the only reason that he does that is because he did something completely different because he lost an eye. You know who this is? Florence Nightingale, good guess especially because she was on the list earlier, but we'll keep that between us. Yeah, Florence Nightingale, you are probably alive today because of her, because she is the one who actually got doctors to wash their hands between surgeries. See, back in the day, doctors used to be barbers, because, hey, if you're good with cutting implements, you're good with cutting implements. You can cut hair, you can do an apodectomy. It's all the same skill set, right? I'm not making that part up, by the way. And they frequently would not bother washing their hands in between patients. Well, Florence Nightingale was a nurse during the Crimean War, during the, during the British-Russian battles during the Crimea. And she noticed that those doctors who washed their hands more frequently, their patients had a tendency to live. Those that didn't, their patients had a tendency to die. She went and talked to the doctors, and the doctors said, what do you know? You're just a woman. Thank you, mid-1800s society. So Florence Nightingale did something absolutely unthinkable at the time. She went to the queen. She tattled on the doctors, basically. But the queen was basically, eh, I'm not sure. What do you mean? How does this work, etc.? So Florence Nightingale actually put together a pictographic representation of how the data broke out. Those doctors who washed their hands, those doctors who didn't. In other words, Florence Nightingale used a pie chart. No PowerPoint was involved, thus proving that you can't blame the tool. She convinced the queen, the queen issued the orders, the doctors now wash their hands. All because one woman took a look, tracked the numbers, and said, wow, there's something interesting going on here. See, the iconoclast perceives things differently. The doctors had all the same data that Florence did. They just chose to use it differently than what she did. You see the world differently. Do you know who this group is? This is an American country western group, the Dixie Chicks. They're a pretty popular group. They were for a long time. They still are, particularly if you're an old fault like me and you recognize groups from way back when. The Dixie Chicks became iconoclasts pretty much entirely by accident because in 2003, during the height of the American involvement in Iraq, Natalie Maines, the lead singer of the Dixie Chicks, during a concert in London said, we're ashamed the President of the United States is from Texas, as George Bush was at the time. You don't do that. They were fine in Europe. 
Europe actually was never particularly fond of the U.S. involvement in Iraq, particularly when the second Bush went in pretty much unilaterally and said, yeah, weapons of mass destruction, invade the country, and oh, it's all fixed now, and bailed. But when they got home, anybody that was associated with the Dixie Chicks was a uh, fair game for a lot of people. The Dixie Chicks themselves received death threats. They got threats that were very, very credible, like you will be shot dead at your concert in Texas. They had round-the-clock surveillance. Matter of fact, a radio station van that had the Dixie Chicks painted on the side of the van had a shotgun pointed at the driver on the freeway just because Dixie Chicks. You can imagine the pressure that that puts on you when you say something like that, and everybody in the world, it seems like, hates you for it, regardless of the truth of the matter. But Maine's never recanted. The Dixie Chicks as a whole never stepped back from this position of, this was an unjust war, and we shouldn't have been involved. A few years later, they cut another album. Radio stations refused to play it. They absolutely wanted nothing to do with it. So it floundered on the Billboard charts but it was the number one download on iTunes. Their fans had forgiven them. The radio stations had not, because you just don't criticize a Republican president when they're from Texas. This is fear. And fear manifests itself in a number of different ways. What's your name, sir? Rolands? Excellent, Rolands. I have two urns in front of you, okay? They're opaque, you can't see what's in them. Each of them holds 18 marbles. The one on the left here holds nine white and nine black marbles. The one on the right, we don't know the composition. I would like for you to pull a marble from the urn and I would like for it to be a white marble. Which urn do you choose, left or right? Choose the right-hand urn. So the one where we don't know the composition, Okay, why? Just to see what happens. Okay, so now when I ask you to do a black marble, which urn will you choose? No, it really doesn't. It really doesn't matter what, what you think. Because here's the funny thing. If you pulled out a marble from the unknown urn, thinking that it might have more black marbles or it might have more white marbles, there's no reason to change your thinking when we flip the color. This is actually what's known in psychological terms as the Ellsberg paradox. In other words, we look at, now most of the time when people do this experiment, they'll actually choose the one with the known composition. If there's nine white and nine black, okay, well, then I've got at least an even chance, so I'll choose that urn, and I'll choose the same urn a second time, even though that's logically inconsistent. If I think it's easier to pull a black marble out of this one than to pull the opposite marble, I should go to the opposite urn, regardless of how the compositions play out. The Ellsberg paradox according to psychologists, is rooted in fear, specifically the fear of the unknown. Ever been driving down the road and you've got this freeway in front of you and suddenly you see all the cars on the freeway turning off on one particular exit and your thought is, what do they know? What do they know that I don't? Because the funny thing is, biologically, we are wired to follow the herd. We are wired to go along with what other people are coming up with, with what other people are deciding. We are naturally wired to avoid going off alone because that's how you get eaten by saber-toothed tigers. Remember that next time you're wandering the streets of Vilnius by yourself. Saber-toothed tigers if you're all by yourself. This manifests itself in other ways too. Do you recognize this craft? It's a space shuttle, right? But which one? What if I show you this photo? Now you know. Yeah, it's the Challenger, isn't it? Everybody recognizes that, particularly those of us in the United States who were alive when this disaster occurred. This was a major, major traumatic event for us. When they did the post-processing, when they did the post-mortem, hate to call it that, but that's really what it was, on the Challenger, 
they discovered that the problems with the O-ring, that is to say the seal on the solid rocket booster, that was a known issue and had been known for quite some time. As a matter of fact, the failure began with the faulty design, increased as both NASA and contractor management first failed to recognize it as a problem, then failed to fix it, and then treated it as an acceptable flight risk. Hey, Dona. Dona Sarkar, everybody, down here in the front. If I told you that your car had a 1% chance of blowing up the next time you decided to drive it, are you going to drive your car? Hell no, she says. How many people disagree with that? They're totally okay driving a car that has a 1% acceptable blow-up risk. I'm not talking about casual accidents. I'm talking about turn the key over, boom. Like you're a mob boss. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, you, you, come on. 1%. 99 times out of 100, it's going to be fine. Right? How in the hell does this happen? NASA is by far one of the most conservative agencies on the planet with respect to design. How do they do it? Well, it's a funny thing. Ever been involved in planning poker? where people go around and estimate how long it will take a particular task. The funny thing is, planning poker was actually a 1960s psychological experiment by Solomon Ash, famous psychologist who did all kinds of interesting experiments that could never be repeated today. You volunteer for one of these experiments because, you know, hey, you're a college student, you could use the cash, and, you know, what could possibly go wrong? You walk into a room of 11 other people, and they show you this photo. You are juror number 12, they ask juror number one, okay, which of these three lines on the right is the same length as the one on the left? And the first juror says A. The second juror says A, and the third one says A, and the fourth one says A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A, 9A, 10A, 11A, 12. B, A, E? No, there is no E. B, you're sure? But everybody else said A. What do they know that you don't? They are liars. That's bold. You just called everybody else in the room a liar. That gets your butt kicked in most bars in Tennessee. They are seeing it from another direction, another dimension. Yeah. Funny thing. 86% of the people who participated in this survey, and yes, the first 11 are plants, but 86% of the people went with the crowd and said A. Because when they were asked later, they said either, oh, well, they must have had a different perspective on it. Maybe, maybe I'm just sitting over here on the wings and I just can't see the lengths correctly. But a significant percentage of them said, no, I genuinely believed A was the same length. They had convinced themselves to go along with the crowd because it's actually really, really hard to be the one person, particularly when the stakes are high, to say, no, this is not right. And if you've been in planning poker, you've seen it happen because you're sitting there and you look at the story and you think this is like maybe a 13. And then everybody else goes around the room and reveals theirs. And it's a two, two, three, two, three, two. And you're like, what the fuck did I get wrong? Yeah, now it's not so easy, is it? And that's when typically you say, hey, you know what? I must be overthinking it. I'll, I'll go with a three, maybe a five if you're really bold. Because the power of the herd is an extraordinarily powerful thing. It's hard to be wrong when the herd is all going in a particular direction. The law of large numbers. When you guess the number of jelly beans in the jar, the average of everybody's guesses is by far and away more accurate than any one individual's guess. This continues to hold. The iconoclast feels fear like anyone else. When somebody says, you could never bring .NET to run on top of an iPhone device. You could never actually get a garbage collector that could perform at all well. 
you could never actually create a language that, fill in the blank. There are lots of people who will naysay you. Stand up right now and say microservices suck. And see, there we go. There we go. There are our iconoclasts. It's hard sometimes. Did you say it three years ago? I didn't think so. Only now, yeah. Because interestingly enough, as soon as there's one dissenting voice, this is something that Ash discovered in his experiment. Even if somebody says C, now you feel safe to say B. All it takes is one tiny bit of dissent and suddenly other people are willing to voice what they really think. But it's hard. It's hard hard to be that dissenting voice when everybody's looking at you a little weird. And one of the things that you have to be able to do is you have to be able to convey your message out to people so that they will recognize it and go with it. You know who this is? That's not me, I swear. This is David Hanemeyer Hansen, also known as the inventor of rails. This slide, this, this picture, is taken from RailsCon, I don't know, many years ago, 10 years ago or so, when Rails 3 was getting released, or Rails 4, and many in the community had come out and said, oh, Rails should do this, Rails should do that, and that was DHH's response. Because we are the, we are the maintainers of the Rails community, we know better than you, so don't bother telling us what we should do. Now, Rails is a really, really interesting technology, and most web technologies, particularly the server-side ones, have taken a lot of Rails' ideas and run with them. Rails was very iconoclastic compared to the J2EE and the .NET of its day. But at the time, Rails succeeded in spite of DHH, because, quite frankly, dude was kind of an asshole. He was not somebody that you could bring in to talk to your boss. He was not somebody that you could bring in to talk to your CTO. And frankly, Rails' relative lack of success in the corporate environment had more to do with DHH than it did with the technology itself. You have to be able to reach people with your message. This gentleman here, you know who he is? He is the inventor of FM radio. Back in the day, all radio stations were AM. How many people still listen to AM radio? Not a hand goes up. Pretty much nobody, oh, one in the back, sorry. What the hell do you listen to on AM radio? Static? What's that? You just have it in your car. It's kind of like the fallback to the fallback to the fallback, like when nothing really works. It was just there when you bought it? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, he's like, eh, I'm tired of having this argument anyway. See, AM is, is by far and away the inferior method for broadcasting signal. Anybody who's ever listened to AM and anyone who's ever listened to FM knows that. But when he invented FM, the industry was very, very highly invested in the AM radio station. And one of his best friends was actually the, the president of RCA, who, had, who owned most of the radio towers in New York. And even after repeatedly demonstrating the technical superiority of FM, they basically said, no, we're not interested. We're not doing this. And Armstrong committed suicide. On the 40th anniversary of Discovery, he basically jumped out the window of his Chicago apartment because he couldn't get anyone to hear what he was trying to say. The fate of the iconoclast who sees it differently and is able to face the fear but cannot exercise social intelligence, what in some scenarios we might call EQ, emotional quotient, is going to go unrecognized. It's going to be yet another one of those, oh, it was ahead of its time kinds of technologies. If only we had known better. Well, you did. Somebody was telling you about it. If you cannot exercise social intelligence, you are not going to get any traction. Social intelligence consists of two things, familiarity and reputation. Anybody know who these two are? Picasso and Van Gogh. Both of them 
masters, right? They're excellent painters. Picasso's estate in 1973 dollars was three quarters of a billion dollars. The man was ridiculously successful. And oh, he was popular. Everybody loved him. He was invited to, to dinners. He was visited with heads of state. There's a famous photo of Pablo Picasso at a White House correspondence dinner where he's got a black marker and a plate and he's literally sketching one of the Marx brothers right there because they came up to him and said, hey, would you do me a sketch? He said, oh, sure, this is what we got. That plate sold for like $5 million recently because it's a Picasso. Van Gogh, on the other hand, died penniless and alone, about 900 paintings to his name because Van Gogh was not what you call socially friendly. This is the man who decided he liked a girl, so as a way of introducing himself, he cut off part of his ear and sent it to her. Now, ladies, this really makes you want to say yes on a date to this guy, right? I mean, let's be fair. Guys, would you want to go on a date with somebody who cut off part of their ear? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Van Gogh was notoriously difficult to approach. It was notoriously difficult to get him to paint anything. Both of them very familiar, but the reputations of each made a huge difference in terms of how successful they were. Familiarity, how well do you recognize the name? How productive are they? How much have they created? Reputation, how connected do you feel to them? Do you feel like you can come up to them and ask something? There are people in this industry today that once they walk off this stage, you feel intimidated to come up to them. And they have a reputation to back that. There are other people in this industry who they can walk off stage and you feel like you can come up and ask them questions and so forth. This is what we mean by social intelligence. You recognize them and they have a reputation of being approachable. How are you recognized in your company? What's your level of familiarity? Does anybody outside your team know who you are? And if they do, what's the reputation you have within the company? Because that's really going to be the key decision maker in whether or not people will listen to you when you do in fact see the world differently and you do in fact face the fear. You need to have both familiarity and reputation with your target audience in order to be able to get them to listen to you. The iconoclast sees the world differently, because remember, perception is a matter of the brain, not the eyes, overcomes the fear, because nobody ever followed the herd and became recognized for doing so. You have to be a part. You have to see things differently. You have to put that message out there and face the fear. There are numerous proverbs, right? The ancient Chinese one, the nail that sticks out is the one that gets hammered flat. You have to face that. You have to overcome that. And you have to do so in a manner that people around you say, yeah, yeah, what they're saying makes sense. I can kind of see it. I don't necessarily believe it just yet, but I'm willing to listen to more. I'm willing to hear more of what they have to say. If you become an iconoclast, even just a tiny one, even if it's just one inside your company, you will not be the person that they lay off when they are looking to cut costs because to do so would be to deny themselves the value of your perception, your fearlessness, and your social intelligence. Be the iconoclast. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Did you ever hear the the possibly apocryphal story of Picasso having lunch in a place and the owner recognizes him and he comes up and he says, if you do a drawing for us, then your food and drinks are all free. And he's like, yeah, no problem. He does a little drawing and the owner comes back and goes, uh, Mr. Picasso, you forgot to sign it. And he went, yeah, I'm paying for my lunch, not your restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff. Thanks, Ted. Folks, we got a 10 minute break. Then we're back here with Kevin and Henny. Take 10, grab some coffee. We'll see you back here in a few minutes. Thank you.